Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out to join us tonight on this snowy evening here in Ithaca, New York. Today we'll be talking about exploring evolution. So we'll be looking at resources that are available to you across the lab's different sites that will help you teach natural and sexual selection in an interactive way. So this webinar is geared toward middle and high school educators, and it will reference curriculum written for those age groups. But if you are here for a different age group, I'm sure you will find something that you can use. And definitely let us know in the chat window, and we'll see if we can come up with adaptations with you. So we're really excited to be here tonight using this new webinar platform, which seems to be a lot friendlier for our audiences. This is, platform is called, for, is called Zoom. And if you haven't been to one of our webinars recently, this might be a new platform for you. So I'm just going to take a quick second here to go over a few different things. Um, so your screen probably looks like this right now and is in full screen. So we actually recommend that you exit full screen and you do that by going up here to the options bar and dropping it down and hitting exit full screen or hitting the escape button. And this will let um, you dock your chat window on the side so you can see what we're seeing, but also join in the conversation on the side. So eventually it should look a little bit more like that. Also be sure to come down here to the bottom of your chat window and select everyone instead of all panelists. That way everybody can join in the conversation together and share ideas. If you have any issues with uh, getting things to work for you in Zoom, you can put those in the chat window and Lindsay will be monitoring that. She can either refer you to the Zoom helpline or can help you out herself, hopefully. All right, so that's our quick introduction to Zoom. Just to make sure that we all know where the chat window is, let's go ahead and put it to the test. If you could take a second to share with us where you're coming from today, what kind of educator you are, um, and what brought you to our webinar, that would be great. So let's give everyone a second to find that chat window and introduce yourself. Awesome, Jane, welcome. <laughs> Hi, Patty, no snow for you in Veracruz. <laughs> Hi, Maria, welcome from Massachusetts. Yamila from Ushuaia, that's incredible. I visited Ushuaia once, beautiful place. John from El Paso. Wow, we've got a really amazing group of educators here. This is super, super awesome. Wonderful, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Lindsay and I are joining you from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which is right here in Ithaca, New York, where it is dark and cold and snowing. Um, but our mission here at the lab, whether snow, rain, or shine, is to interpret and conserve the Earth's biological diversity through research, education, and citizen science focused on birds. My name is Kelly Schaefer, and I'll be your presenter tonight, and I'm here with my partner in crime, Lindsay Glasner, who is our outreach coordinator, co excuse me, coordinator with BirdSooth K-12. Here at Bird Sleuth, our mission is to create innovative K-12 resources that build science skills while inspiring young people to connect to local habitats, explore biodiversity, and engage in citizen science projects. So basically, we get to take all the really cool stuff that the lab does and package it for educators. And so that's really what this webinar is about tonight, because if you have been on our Bird Sleuth website, you may have found our evolution lessons, which we will be going over, but you might have missed out on some really awesome interactives that have been put out by the lab and the Bird Academy website. So we'll get to those as well tonight. So here's what we'll be looking to cover in tonight's webinar. First, we'll be talking just a little bit about our understanding of evolution, 
Then we'll take a very quick look at the Evolution in Paradise lessons, which are available as a free download. We'll explore the wall of Birds Interactive, and then we'll check out some other resources from Bird Academy, including All About Anatomy, All About Fancy Males, and All About Feathers. So let's jump right into our topic here and start looking and thinking about evolution. So how would you define evolution? What are some key words or a definition? And if you could provide those for us in the chat window. And while you're thinking and typing, I just want to share that this image on screen is a simplified phylogenic tree, which is, means it shows uh, the evolutionary history of related organisms, in this case, certain tropical tanagers, which are really gorgeous. And these phylogenic trees are often created with DNA sequencing information and actually similar to a cladogram, but the difference is that phylogenic trees show evolutionary time as well and the length of the branches, which is pretty cool. All right, so we got some answers coming and let's take a look. Susan says successful mistakes. I really <laughs> like that. <laughs> That's a really great, great way to look at it. Maria says, evolution is change in the diversity of a species over long periods of time. I love the inclusion of that period of time. Gradual changes and adaptations, adapting to surroundings over time, survival strategies, changing over time, diversified adaptations over time. This is really great. You guys are hitting on what I think are, is one of the really key components of, of these definitions is that change over time. So we can say that evolution is defined as an ongoing process in which species change over time. Or more specifically, we can say that evolution occurs when changes in the heritable traits of a population of organisms are passed through successive generations. So these heritable traits can be a number of different things. And usually the mechanism working uh, here is natural selection. Um, so tonight we're gonna be discussing natural selection. We'll also talk about sexual selection, which is a specific form of natural selection. And it's really important to note here that what you all started to point out is that these changes happen over time, um, that they aren't, that they're kind of accidental, right? They're happy accidents. Um, that change a population over time. So let's look at a couple misconceptions that you might run into when teaching evolution. I've definitely run into them before, and sometimes I still find myself um, speaking about evolution using some of these misconceptions. First big one to note, evolution occurs within a population. Individuals do not evolve. Individuals might mutate, but they don't evolve. So evolution happens um, when changes to individuals accrue over time and they get passed down. So populations are changing over generational time. So a whole population does not change at once. It is a long process. And the mechanism of this process happens um, because of variation due to recombination and random mutation. So these are not purposeful changes. So it's not like in animal sees that their habitat is changing and they need to adapt to it. It's these random genetic changes that result in traits. The favorable ones will be passed on to the next generation. So variation doesn't arise as a response to environmental conditions. And I will sometimes say phrases or words that still can kind of imply that, so watch, watch for that and call me out if I do it tonight. Natural selection also favors traits that improve survival, but those as well that improve reproductive success. And so you can have a trait that would improve survival, um, but might actually negatively affect reproductive success. And that trait then is not going to get passed on. So it needs to. Um, either improve survival and not affect success or affect reproductive success because it's all about passing these genes on to the next generation. 
So we're going to go ahead and jump right into what some of this might look like in practice. So we're going to look at evolution in paradise, which is the free downloadable lesson. And Lindsay's going to share the link to that in the chat window. There are three lessons in this download. The first is science and paradise. The second is sexual selection and the third heritable behaviors. So these lessons are really awesome because they take advantage of these incredible gorgeous birds called the birds of paradise. There are 15 genera of birds of paradise breaking down into 39 different species. These birds evolved in New Guinea, which is really a land of plenty for birds. So there are relatively few predators in New Guinea and abundant food. And that means they weren't under strong selection pressures other than competition for mates. And these are the perfect breeding grounds for some of these bizarre, crazy traits you see in the birds on screen in front of you. So these lessons use these incredible and inspiring birds to examine the phenomena of natural selection, specifically sexual selection. So we're going to take a quick moment here to introduce ourselves to the birds of paradise. Bear with me while I switch the screen that we're looking at. All right. They go from expected to extraordinary in the blink of an eye. You're awestricken. They transform themselves to something that you've never seen before. They swagger and serenade. They dance and display. They're unlike any creatures on Earth and one of the most astounding phenomena ever witnessed. The birds of paradise. Found here. So just in that short clip, you can begin to see some of the really incredible and strange adaptations that these birds have. Um, which makes them the, really the perfect study group of birds to look at when you talk about evolution. So the first lesson in evolution in paradise is all about the scientists who study these birds. So lesson one utilizes three different videos to introduce students to Ed Scholes and Tim Lamont, who spent eight years of their lives documenting these 39 different species of birds. And so it came out to something like 18 or 19 separate expeditions that they took to New Guinea to make sure that they could photograph every species of bird of paradise. And so the idea here is to show how scientists use the scientific process to answer real world questions and to show that science doesn't always look like what we imagine. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you were to give uh, a kid, the assignment of drawing a scientist. Starting from a young age, this is pretty much what you're going to get. You're going to get the man in the lab coat with the crazy hair, or in this case, a truly excellent mustache, some beakers and Bunsen burners, and some equations on the board behind them. So it's this very laboratory-based vision of what it means to be a scientist, which isn't inaccurate, but it's kind of a narrow view. And we like to help kids see a little bit more. So through these lessons, kids start to actually see that scientists 
can look like these folks do. They can be outside, they can have binoculars and cameras as their equipment of choice, and still be answering questions and using the scientific process and scientific protocols, but outside getting dirty and answering a different type of question. Which uh, is really a fun thing to watch kids go through this process of a changing image of what science is and what scientists look like because then it's not such a, a leap for a kid to think, well, maybe I'm a scientist or I can be a scientist. This lesson also explores the scientific process and how it can be applied in different settings that can be an, uh, and that it can be something other than that really linear process that we tend to be taught in school. It can be kind of messy and folding back on itself and always requiring critical thinking. So that's the goal of this first lesson. The second lesson is all about sexual selection and introducing the idea of sexual selection as a type of natural selection. So before we go too far into this, let's take a moment to define natural selection, the primary process by which evolution occurs. So why don't you go ahead and take a moment in the chat window and share any thoughts or keywords that you have about what natural selection is. Survival of the fittest. <laughs> See, a process by which adaptations are selected for or against for survival of the species. A trait that is passed from generation to generation, usually to the benefit of the species. Elements of the environment that put pressure on a species and favor certain traits over others. So I'm seeing a lot of um, the use of the word traits, which is great. Uh, a lot of those being selected for or against based on whether or not they're beneficial to the individual. Oh, I like that. Organisms are less le that are less adapted to the environment are less likely to reproduce. An increase in frequency of traits that best support survival. Yeah, you guys are all hitting on a lot of the main points. And as you can kind of start to see from this uh, picture description we've got going on here on screen, it is about traits that appear in a population through variation. And remember, we talked variation being mutation or recombination. Um, and so in this case, we're seeing that, that this bird developed a long beak. And this long beak helped the bird access a food resource that was previously inaccessible to it and helped it survive. And then its genes got passed on to the next generation. And over time, the long beak is a dominant trait in this, in this species. So we can say, that natural selection is the evolutionary process by which genes for traits that improve survival or reproductive success are favored. So you all had absolutely awesome definitions with elements of natural selection really well in there, including traits that improve survival being passed on. But don't forget those traits for reproductive success as well. And that's really where sexual selection starts to come in. And one of the ways that we can start to see sexual selection actually is through um, sexual dimorphism. So have you guys heard of sexual dimorphism before? And if you have, go ahead and share um, either an animal that you think ex um, excuse me, exhibits sexual dimorphism or what you think sexual dimorphism is. Mary Cardinal is one of the first one that pops into my head too. Ben says red wing blackbirds, absolutely. 
So yeah, Mary is right in saying that sexual dimorphism is when males and females of a species look different. Distinctive differences between male and female, absolutely. So our examples right now are cardinals, red-winged blackbirds. Any other examples? They don't have to be in the bird world. Deer, elephant seals, yeah. Peacocks, lions, insects. A lot of insects do, yeah. Beta fish. That's a really great one. I hadn't thought of that one. That's a really great one. Yeah, so all of those exhibit sexual dimorphism, even people, absolutely. So what are the traits and all of those that you mentioned, the lions, the peacocks, the polar bears, the red-winged blackbirds, the cardinals, what are the traits in those species that are exhibiting these differences in males and females? So what traits exhibit dimorphism? Jill says polar bales at the zoo is size-based, color, color. What about deer? What's different between male and female deer? Antlers, yeah. And so what you'll start to see when you really start to break down what traits are exhibiting dimorphism, yeah, genitalia will be different between species, but even in species that uh, look the same, that's true. So it's less about um, the genitalia in this case, even though those are different, it's more about the different, the other ways that they're different in size and shape and color, ways that make them appear different when first look. So yeah, some females can have antlers, Jill's pointing out, yes, that's true. So when you break down these traits that exhibit dimorphism, what you really start to see is that there are two categories. You have traits for fighting and you have traits for attraction. So traits that are fancy, like the color of a male cardinal, for example. So, or the epaulets on the red-winged blackbird. Or an elephant seal's nose. So that's how these traits break down. And when you see sexual dimorphism, it's a really good signal to you that sexual selection is at work, is one of the evolutionary forces helping to shape this species. And you can kind of start to see on something like this deer how that would work. Like the size of the antlers reflects the condition of the, of the male deer and he might have, the buck might have more success in fighting either for mates or territory. That seems pretty straightforward. But when you look at something like this Wilson's bird of paradise, it becomes a little bit more confusing. Like why on earth does this bird have a, a bald patch of blue skin on its head? It can be a little bit more mystifying how these traits come about through sexual selection. So we're gonna watch another brief clip from one of this lesson's videos. And we'll learn a little bit more about how this process of sexual selection might work to create a bird like the Wilson's Bird of Paradise. Sexual selection is the process by which traits become more or less common depending on an individual's ability to mate with more or better partners. To really understand how this works, let's revisit our island population now full of long-billed birds. These new bills have improved their diet so much that it's easier to raise young. Females can raise chicks on their own, freeing up males for the mating game. And in this food-rich environment, 
sexual selection can become a more dominant evolutionary force. How food is distributed, whether it's clustered or dispersed, can have a dramatic effect on what kinds of traits will be favored by sexual selection. Let's look at two situations, one that leads to male-male competition and one that leads to female choice. First, male-male competition, which we'll demonstrate with the trait burly. When a primary food source, like fruit trees, are clustered, males can defend territories around them to gain exclusive access to the females who come there to eat. A male who was born burly is better able to defend a territory and will be able to mate with more females. Thus, burly males will have more offspring and their genes will become more common. Each generation of males will get burlier and burlier to the point of impacting their survival. Females who mate with burly males benefit in two ways. They have access to the food they need and their sons are more likely to be burly and successful. But females don't get burly since they were already the right size for survival and there is no advantage for them to carry this extra weight. Natural selection and sexual selection are pushing females and males into very different forms. And this difference between the sexes is a telltale indicator of sexual selection at work. Now let's look at mate attraction, specifically female mate choice. This kind of selection happens most dramatically when bountiful resources like fruit are spread out and impossible for males to defend. Instead, males must try to attract females, convincing them that they are the best possible mates. A male who is born fancy might have an ornament that he uses to attract females. If the ornament works and more females choose to mate with him, then the genes for fancy will be passed on. Fancy traits may be innately appealing to females or they may reveal something about the male's underlying health. In either case, these genes give rise to fancy males and females who prefer mates with those particular genes. Each generation, males become more elaborate until the traits significantly decrease their chances of survival. And just like our first situation, the females don't change because natural selection still favors their camouflage coloration. To sum up, classic natural selection leads to adaptations for gathering resources and surviving. Sexual selection leads to adaptations for gathering mates and breeding. These two kinds of selection may seem different, but the mechanism behind them is actually the same. The competition to leave more copies of the genes in the next generation. Evolution is never ending, with recombination and mutation creating new traits every generation. Most of these will die out, but those traits that provide an advantage in the competition to breed inevitably become more common over time, sometimes transforming the drab into the magnificent. All right. So I really love those videos. I think they do a really great job of illustrating what natural and sexual selection are. The video I just shared with you, we watched the second half of it, which explains sexual selection. The first half um, covers natural selection. And they're pretty accessible, and the Birds of Paradise are just such great teachers of this material. After you watch this video, or I should say, with the lesson comes a worksheet that you can hand out while this video is being watched. This is a, a short version of it. It actually goes through 
in the worksheet itself that you get with a lesson, A through J, as different traits, um, with the intention that these letters get sorted into the appropriate box. So some might go into natural se selection, some might go into sexual selection, and then some might specifically go into female choice or male-male competition. So why don't we just take a moment right now, pick out any one of these statements, and go ahead and read it and see if you can figure out what box you would put it into. And you can share your answer with us in the chat window. You, you don't need to do them all, you can just pick out one and see how it goes. All right, lots of good answers rolling in. Give you one more second to, to take a look here. Awesome. See into choice, yep. So here's where they all fall. So D, produces females and males of the same species that look similar, is natural selection. So Patty had that answer. B, the process by which traits become more or less common depending on an individual's ability to mate with more or better partners, is sexual selection. Then both A and C, occurs when food sources are dispersed and males with ornaments that females find attractive are able to mate with more females and pass on their genes. Both of those fit into female choice. With E occurs when food sources are clustered, falling into male-male competition. Awesome, well done. I really found this, the first time I did this lesson myself, I watched these videos, I had the sheet in front of me. It was really helpful for me to put these letters into their categories. It really helped me clarify the difference between sexual and natural selection, and also to see some of the primary forces um, that make female choice and male-male competition so different. All right, so that is a quick look at lesson two. So we're gonna pass on now to lesson three, which looks at heritable behaviors. So in this lesson, through two videos and two activities and lots of discussion, we learn how physical traits aren't the only traits that can be encoded in our genes. To understand this further, let's first define what a gene is. So what are genes or what is a gene? Feel free to share your thoughts in the chat window. We've been talking a lot about traits today. And traits do relate closely to genes. So Maria is saying that a gene is a section of DNA that codes for a protein or part of a protein. Absolutely. And how that manifests is how traits are displayed, at least in the case of when we're looking at sexually dimorphic species in their appearance. Genes hold the information of the individual. Jill's pointing out that traits that are in our genes are passed on to our offspring. And Jane says, a sequence of DNA that codes for one protein. Yeah, so these are great definitions. The definition that we use in this lesson are less related to proteins, though that is, of course, very accurate. 
So a gene can also be said to say that it is information encoded in DNA that determines a particular trait in an organism. And often that mechanism through which the trait is portrayed is the creation of proteins. So yeah, it's, but when we're looking at this big picture of the appearance of an organism, we can kind of simplify that to say it determines a particular trait. Okay, so one of the really cool things that we can learn about genes is how they affect our appearance and how they affect some other really cool <laughs> things about us and some things we don't always think about. We can see how genes relate pretty directly to our appearance, but that's not the only thing that they cope for. So we're gonna take a moment here to switch back to another clip from a video and see if we can't discover one of the other really cool things that genes are responsible in part for. It may look wacky, it may look funny, but these behaviors didn't evolve to be wacky and funny. They evolved through sexual selection by female choice to be precise, choreographed things that these males do time and time again, day after day, throughout their whole lives, specifically to be attractive to females during courtship. Which birds of paradise dance? At some level, you could say all of them do something that could be interpreted as a dance. But if you just hold up a pose and stand there static, while there could be the static holding dance, I typically think of that not as a dance, but as just a pose. And that dance is when there's more motion involved or intricate steps. Parodias are good examples of dance. Not probably coincidental that they're also the ones that dance on the ground like they're on a dance floor. They look a little bit more like the way humans dance. When you see something like a greater bird of paradise or one of the other paradisias bouncing around up and down a branch and turning and pivoting and putting its head down and letting its cascade of feathers fall over its back, I mean, that's, that's clearly a dance. And then even something like the Wilson's or Magnificent Bird of Paradise where they're they're just doing most of their displays on a small little sapling, and there's not a lot of lateral motion. There's just movement up and down the branch, but there are parts of it that are definitely more dance-like and less just presentation than others, especially right before actual mating, where there's a little bit of motion this way, motion that way, motion this way, motion that way. Small series of things that happen. I would call that a pre-mating dance, even in that species. One thing that people don't realize about Bird of Paradise is that they're not born doing those courtship displays exactly the way that, that we see them and admire them as adults. For the first few years of their life, they probably don't do anything that looks like a courtship display at all. And then at some point in time, the young males, they start going through transitions in their bodies and their behaviors where they start doing rudimentary versions of it. They're hardwired from their genes through their DNA to start doing courtship displays. But yet, they don't have the feathers yet, and they only do rudimentary versions of them. But they begin to essentially practice them. And they practice them in isolation by themselves. They watch adult males performing the, the real deal to actual females and mating. And then they practice to each other. One young male plays the role of the female, and the other one plays the role of the male. This one practices his display and this one pretends like it's watching and then they switch and this goes on for hours at a time during the day, for months out of the year, for many years. In many cases, three, four years of this kind of practice behavior. And so only then when they transition into their first adult plumage do they start doing this thing that we recognize as the full courtship display.
So it's this incredible combination of learning behavior and feedback between practicing with your own body movement and the acquisition of your costume, if you will, and being able to then put those motions into place in the way that they're supposed to be and the genetics behind it, both the behavior and the feathers. I don't think a lot of people have an appreciation that that's what's going on in these birds. I really love the footage of the young males practicing their dance before they have all the ornamentation. It's pretty fun to see. So what I think is so cool about that, those clips and that video there, is that you really start to see that genes aren't just responsible for how we look, but they can also be responsible for some of our behaviors, which is kind of mind blowing. You might say, have said to somebody before, it's in your genes, but sometimes it really is. But one of the things here that um, Ed Scholes does such a good job of pointing out is that it isn't just our genes that are responsible for this. There's other, there's other factors as well, including environmental factors. So a behavioral trait can be influenced by both genetics and environment. And a great example of that is what we just witnessed, these young birds of paradise having this drive to start their courtship behaviors, even before they have the proper feathers to do it. But then there's also that component of them watching other males, of them practicing together, and taking a long time to get it right. So what might be encoded for in their DNA and the drive to start dancing isn't in their DNA, but the exact way in which it is performed is influenced by practice. And this can also be true for physical traits. So there can be traits that are encoded for in our genetics but that are affected by environmental factors. And a great example of this is the color red in birds. So a lot of times the color red in bird isn't just dictated by the fact that their feathers are creating pigment because the pieces and parts that they need to create these pigments come from their diet. So if they don't have a good diet with the proper components, they aren't gonna be able to create as vivid of a red. So red is both genetic and also environmental. So these traits are created by these two different factors interacting, which is really cool to think about. So that is a very, very quick overview of a few different aspects of these lessons. I didn't go into them all in depth, or share with you the discussion questions or all of the activities that are included in these lessons. I just kind of wanted to give you a sampling of what these lessons look like, let you get a feel for the quality of the videos that are used, and just to show you how, how perfect the birds of paradise really are when you're teaching evolution. And then I also now, I want to take the remaining time of our time here together tonight and look at some of the other really amazing resources that are out there for you um, that the lab has created. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch us out one more time from our PowerPoint here. And see if we can't head to the internet for an exploration of some really cool other features. All right. So the first thing I would like to share with you is the wall of birds. And Lindsay's going to share the link to this resource with you in the chat window. We'll go ahead and get started here. This is a large stitched together image of the incredible, incredible mural that exists here at the Lab of Ornithology. If you ever get to come visit, it's basically worth it, in my opinion, for this mural alone, where the birds are vividly and detailed, um, painted at life size. You can stand next to an albatross and see how you stack up. And coming down the stairs here, you can see some of the evolutionary history of the bird depicted by hand-chosen ancestors. So we have um, some rather famous ones like Archaeopteryx, some ones you might not have heard of before either that have some pretty great feathers. 
they all have some traits that you recognize, like the feathers in the wing, but some that might seem a little strange, like the teeth and the beak. And it's kind of fun to see how these traits change over time as you come down the stairs and you can start to see some things that look a bit more like birds, though for a while they still have some other traits like teeth that might be strange. And what's really cool about this resource is you can click on the bird that you're interested in. Up on the left hand side here comes a little description of what you're looking at. And then once you come down the stairs, you get into our extant family of birds. Um, there is a representative here from each family of birds, which is pretty cool. And you will notice a few grayed out here. These are what would be considered modern birds but have gone extinct. Like, I believe this is the elephant bird. Yes, the elephant bird here. And so one thing to know about these birds is that they are positioned with one foot touching their range or where, where you might find them in the real world as well. So they're pretty accurately placed so you have an idea of, of how all this diversity relates to each other, which I think is pretty fabulous. And the diversity that you see here ties in so well to talking about evolution. It can be a really great way to put to the test some of the knowledge that you gain in the lessons that we just discussed. For example, I like to have uh, students try and look at this wall and use this imagery and see if they can find a bird that exhibits evidence of sexual selection. And so you can zoom in. Get a close look some here. You can see really colorful birds. You can see birds with very exaggerated features. And you can see some that have really exaggerated features but aren't as colorful. And you, when you click on them, you get this great information over here. So challenging students to find a, a bird on the wall that exhibits sexual selection and then having them back that up with evidence that they either get here over on this sidebar or through other internet explorations. So this one that I clicked on here is a long trained night jar. And the first thing that we read about this night jar on the side here is that it has a display perch. The long trained night jar male puffs out its throat, raises its tail forming a right angle, and the female night jar watches from above him and judges which is what we just saw basically happening with the birds of paradise. And so we can guess from the really incredibly exaggerated length of the tail here that that's probably not something that really benefits its survival, but probably benefits its ability to reproduce. And then the inclusion of the perch and the judging from the females hints at female choice, which is a part of sexual selection. So if you had a student pick out this bird and point out those evidence, you'd be able to say, yeah, great, this is a really excellent example of sexual selection. There's lots of birds that exhibit that here on the wall. Something like these little long-tailed mannequins here that do group displays, leapfrogging over each other, cooperative displays, pretty cool to think about. And then the dominant male gets to be the one who mates. All sorts of really amazing things. The aura pendulas who flip upside down in their displays. You can come all the way out over to da -da -da, Australia. Catch the lyre bird with its incredible plume of tails and its incredible voice. So the lyre bird is a mimic. And I'll take a second here just to play this for you. See if you can recognize any different sorts of sounds in here. strange. I love listening to them. Much like our mockingbirds, catbirds, and thrashers in North America, this is a mimic. Um, and you can find a really super cool clip 
with David Attenborough listening to a lyrebird on YouTube, and it mimics chainsaws and camera shutters and then the rewind drive on a camera. It's pretty, pretty incredible. But yeah, if you look at this based on that mating song and its uh, incredible feathers and little dances that it does, you can guess again, sexual selection is here at work on this bird. So there can be a, some fun ways to just kind of test that knowledge that you learned and put it together. And then here's our bird of paradise on the wall the kingbird of Saxony with those really incredible and bizarre head wires. So this is a really fun uh, interactive to play around with. I have lost a lot of time that I don't regret losing <laughs> to the exploration of this wall of birds. The next resource I would like to share with you uh, is called All About Bird Anatomy, and Lindsay's going to share the link with that for that with you in the chat window. This is another really cool interactive, and what's really neat about it is it can suit your needs in a lot of different ways. If you're learning very in depth, in detail bird anatomy, this is a really great tool to use for you. In our case, when we're talking about sexual selection, and we're talking about sexual selection as far as appearance goes, we'll start with having the feathers on. So you click over here on this large area and you can have just the feathers on, and then you can click on these different groups of feathers and learn about them. So I don't know if you remember the greater bird of paradise that we looked at in the video footage. It was the bird with the huge yellow plumes coming from behind it that would jump up and down the branches and shake them around while calling. And you was like, the first time you look at it, you're like, is that its tail? What's going on there? But if you take a quick look, you realize that it's the mantle of the bird. You can see the feathers coming around from the back and even just a little bit under the wings when you look at the footage very closely. So this bird that we're looking at here is really a very basic bird. This is what you would consider the most uh, basic features of a bird. And so it's kind of cool to look at these here and see how they change. Or the proteas, the birds that were doing those really excellent ballerina-like dances and the shinnies with the umbrella-like feathers. Those are coming from their chest, not their wings or their tail. Their chest feathers get elongated and they have this cool little shield that they're able to puff up. And then we saw iridescence happening on the throat, we saw iridescence happening on the forehead. So there's all sorts of different ways that you can see some changes happening here. If you want to get into some really in-depth things, there's lots of different things you can look at. I really like looking at the respiratory system because birds have really cool circular airflow that uses all these really neat air sacs. So it's a really cool way to look at that as well. All right, another resource that is available to you is all about birds, fancy males. And as you can guess, this is all about natural selection through sexual selection. So this has a lot of different sections here. If you pop out over here, you can see what these different selections are. You can see fancy males, different ways of being fancy. Oh, there's our liar bird from the wall of birds. And so sometimes they're gonna have um, little interactives that you click through. They're gonna have videos that you can watch. These are great resources to have if you have a one-to-one -one classroom or you have technology available, um, computer labs available and things to have kids work through at their own pace. Um, so it combines a bunch of different media types. You can see uh, one of the videos from the Birds of Paradise here as well. You even get to start to see why females are choosy. So it goes into depth about the reproductive benefits for males and the reproductive challenges for females where their eggs are more energetically costly to create. So therefore, they're the ones who get to be choosy, whereas sperm are relatively cheap to create and males can afford to mate with a lot of different so it goes into depth about all these different things. Another great resource is all about birds, all about feathers, again, on the Bird Academy site. 
And this one is a little bit more basic. It goes through feathers just in general. So if you scroll down, instead of launching straight away, you can go straight to feathers through time, which is the part here that really focuses on evolution. And so you can see and learn here about how feathers started out. And the prevailing and predominant theory right now is actually, oops, here, that's what I wanted to do, is actually uh, called dinophys. So there's a bunch of different theories around feathers. And even in the last 15 years or so, the, the theory that I learned is no longer the dominant theory. And so you can see how they suspect feathers changed over time. That's how a feather grows now. And you can learn a lot about evolution in this little module too, which is really great. But there's something that's super cool that just happened today that I'm really excited to share with you. So there are two different theories here about how feathers developed their current shape, which was about number five. Whether they started out as having a strong central shaft or whether as we show in this interactive, they have these crazy little barbules that then started to fuse together in a central shaft. And there's actually just today a paper published that supports this theory here in this interactive. And I think it's so cool. So I'm going to show it to you right now. The, um, I think Lindsay has the article link to share. I have the article link. I'll share it in case you're interested. Um, so this piece of amber, amber was found in a market in Myanmar. And what you're looking at here is the tail of a baby dinosaur that they say was probably about the size of the sparrow at the time that it was caught in amber, would have grown to be about the size of an ostrich. Um, and you can see right in here, you can see the feathers. They're starting to look a little bit more like modern feathers. Um, and this is from 99 million years ago. But what you see are really dense feathers, lots of barbules and, this, uh, and barbs. And this is really cool because this puts forth the idea that these structures happened, these fluffy structures happened a lot sooner than we thought, which favors the theory that you actually see in the Feather Interactive that I just shared with you, which is all really super cool. Um, so it's all really current information that you're getting when you go onto Bird Academy. It's all really great media put together that makes learning fun, and it kind of puts all of this evolution stuff in a bigger context and takes you outside of just the birds of paradise and helps you put some of the things you learn from that module to the test um, through the wall of birds and these other interactives. So definitely feel free to explore these interactives. They're super fun. Uh, and hopefully you all enjoyed this quick look at evolution through the birds of paradise and the different resources available to you at the lab. I'm going to go ahead and put up our PowerPoint one more time just so that you can have our contact information and you can see our question bird because I love that bird. So cute. Um, so do keep in touch with us as we go forward. I'm going to put a poll up on the screen here. If you wouldn't mind taking a second to fill it out just to let us know how you felt about this webinar and if you'd be interested in future webinars from us, that would be really great. Um, otherwise, Lindsay and I are here to answer questions. We'll be in the chat window. Um, and I will share that link right now. Let me pop up my chat window. So the, the article was, the scientific article was published in Current Biology, but there is NPR's write-up of that article. Mary, you read the article. I was so excited to see this today. It was perfect timing.
So for those of you who are still on the webinar, we really appreciate you taking the poll. Um, this webinar is being recorded and we'll make the recording live on our free webinars page, birdsleuth.org, um, the URL listed on the uh, PowerPoint here. We will also, if you want, we can provide you a certificate of completion. So if you do want to have a formal documentation for professional development purposes that you did attend this webinar for one contact hour, just email us, birdsleuth at cornell.edu. We can send you that certificate of completion tomorrow as well. And we'll be happy to take any questions from you guys. Thanks, everyone. Have a nice night. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and mute myself, but feel free to continue asking questions in the chat window for the next few minutes. We'll be hanging around. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Maria, you can. Oops, Maria, you can uh, email for a certificate. It's the email that's on the power right now. Birdsleuth at cornell .edu. If your poll is in the way, you can just pull across to the side. If your poll won't submit either, don't worry about it. We'll figure it out. <laughs> Thank you for trying. <laughs> Please go ahead and end the poll. Yeah, I'll go ahead and end the poll now, so it should get out of your way on the screen. Great, thank you so much, especially to those who've been coming to these webinars on a monthly basis. Our next webinar will be in January, and I believe that, is that Great Backyard Bird Count time? It is. It's Great Backyard Bird Count season coming up. I'm excited. Um, we are going to head out. Seems like there's no questions, but feel, feel free to contact us at any point in time um, through our website, on social media, or with the email address listed. Thanks, everyone.